who says that they can't teach an old dog new tricks, eh? I was really surprised this morning as I came here and I saw some of the kids standing up that I used to teach Sunday school to. And I was really surprised as I started to think, you know, how small they were when I was teaching them and how big they are now and how people have been aging. Uh, I, 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 you know, I can almost hear about three or four women start going, <gasps> he's talking about me. But uh, no, I was just looking at those girls and realizing how quickly they grew up. I remember Angie was just as a little girl, now she's a big girl. I was going to say the little skinny girl, but now she's a big skinny girl, but I didn't think she'd appreciate that, so I won't say it. This morning as I come here, I count it as my privilege to do something that I truly love to do, and that's to share the Word of God with you this morning. But yet, I find it very hard to do, for this morning, a burden has been placed upon my heart. I know if I said it was in my stomach, some of you might accuse my wife of being a bad cook, but it is really in my heart. The thing that, that often burdens me is something that has sort of been passed on to me, and it's a set of notes given to me my, by my brother. Actually, I took them off his desk the day that he went to be with the Lord, and he left the message that is most important for all of us, really, to get a hold of. One of the things that really I've noticed in the last little while is, as I've been looking back, is the strange things that happen sometimes in our lives and how they all work out towards the good. And I realized that the most important thing for me as a Christian is, is that my life count as a Christian. And I see that there's two areas, basically, that causes our Christian lives to sort of go on and do things, and we're very busy, but not count for anything. And... Before we go any further, let's just bow our heads in prayer and ask the Lord to really speak to our hearts this morning. Father, we thank you for your love. Father, that great love of yours has given us your word. Father, it's given us gifted individuals. Some of the men, Father, that we will be speaking of and from this morning that you've burdened their hearts to share a message. Also, Father, I think of the words that have been left by other Christians who are believers that carry on today in their lives. And this morning, as we think, Father, of your word and the examples and illustrations from it and the message, Father, that is there and that for us, we do pray, Father, that you would speak to our lives, that we would go away from this place this morning saying, Lord, we will live for you. Father, we will not live just fruitless lives, but we will live strong and faithful lives for you. In Jesus' name, amen. I was thinking, when I started thinking about making a life that of counted of a, of a story that I had heard. Actually, I guess there's two stories I should tell you before I start speaking. The first one is about a, a preacher who got up to speak, and I usually speak for about 45 minutes, so I thought I'd just let you get prepared for that, you know, get a good, comfortable seat. This preacher got up into the pul or came to the church one day. It was a country preacher, and it had been raining and real muddy, and he got to the church, and there was only one person there. And so he, he said to the to the, to the man that was there, well, I guess nobody's here, we should go home. And the fellow said, no, 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 no. He says, I'm not too smart, I'm just a farmer. Uh, I don't want to make a slur there, I'll keep on going with this story. He said, uh, but I do know this one thing. He said, uh, if uh, I go out to feed my cows and only one cow comes, I feed him. And the, and the preacher said, that sounds like a good idea, I think I'll do that. And he started to speak and he preached. And he preached not for one hour, but two hours, but three hours. And when he'd finished, uh, he started to leave, and he said, well, how did you like that sermon to the fellow? And the guy said, well, I'm not too smart. I'm just a farmer. But he said, there is something that I do know. He says, if only one cow showed up, I wouldn't feed him all the hay. <laughs> well, tonight, this morning, I don't want to leave you out with all the hay, and there's much to be gone over. I have lots and lots of notes, but that doesn't, I guess, always mean something. There's one other thing as we get on to our what we're going to look at this morning, and that's something that illustrates the point so well. I was really interested in what John had to say this morning because it's just almost a prelude, a perfect prelude to what I, I was going to talk about. I was thinking in, in terms of Martha that her devotion was great to the Lord, and as John was using that, uh, 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 talking about her attitude, I was thinking more in terms of motives. Why was she living? She was living to, to make something or do something for herself. Well, that's really, I think, the biggest problem for us as Christians is we often live our lives and we're not properly committed. And because we're not properly committed, then we're not properly motivated. 
And that's the two things that I'd like us to look at to this morning. A uh, flyer one time, you can probably tell this story is not a true one, but a flyer one time had uh, been out flying his mission in, in World War II, and as he, he had been flying, he had a really good successful day. He had shot down a couple enemy aircrafts and had sunk one destroyer and left a battleship lift listing. And he was so excited, he couldn't wait to get pa back to talk to the captain of the ship. They had been talking about how good he, he, how flyer he was, and he was out to prove, you know, just how great a person he was. And he was really excited. And so when he saw the, the battleship that he came from, he just landed his airplane, and he ran right up to the, uh, get out of his, his uh, plane and didn't even take his life preserver off. He ran right up into the pot house of the, of the battleship and started talking to the captain and he was taking his life preserver off and he said you should have seen the day that I had you wouldn't believe it I sank uh, I list, left the battleship listing I strength, strength, sank a destroyer and I shot down two or three planes and he's just getting his, his, his life preserver off over his eyes when he heard wow you made a very poor mistake you landed on the wrong boat yank <laughs> well you know what I think that really sums up my fears because I think sometimes we're going to get to heaven or some of us are going to get to heaven and we're going to be, you know, just, whew, well, I'm in heaven now and I can start relaxing a bit here. And all of a sudden we're going to realize that while we are running around on earth and we are blowing up battleships or winning battles or carrying out young peoples or preaching in our pulpits or, or filling up the Sunday school and doing things for the Lord, that we've made a real serious mistake we've been doing it all for ourselves. And if you don't believe that you can do something for yourself in the ministry, then you go and look at the burnout rate of preachers and teachers of God's Word. Do you know approximately 15% leave the ministry every year from burnout? Because they're doing things and running places and going places. And they're doing so much for the Lord, but they're failing. And that's what I don't want. I don't want to have to get to heaven and stand before the Lord. And he said, Phil, you were on the wrong boat. You've been on the wrong boat. You've done so much, but you've done nothing for me. And that scares me. And that's why when I looked at my brother's notes, I realized that that's something that really I, it had to speak to me. I read it at my brother's funeral, and I had a tough time at, with it. But this morning, I hope to have a little bit easier time. My brother, Mark, just before... He went to be with the Lord, was getting ready <coughs> to speak uh, at Young People's on January the 14th. Uh, right, on January the 14th. That would have been a Friday night, I believe. And uh, 24th, I'm sorry. I'm getting my dates mixed up here. But the Lord took Mark home on January the 23rd. But he left these notes on his desk. And as I went down there, it just boggled my mind. And I guess perhaps maybe I can illustrate it with another story. I was thinking of, of how much my brother had changed in six months. I, when we were working on the boat together in the fall, I just we had a Christian radio station that we could listen to, and it used to really break my heart that I had to, you know, just put up with grumbling and everything else that I could hear from my brothers and my dad and myself. And so we decided that I was going to get a radio. In fact, I decided. My wife didn't like it too much, but we went and I bought a radio. And I put it on my credit card, and I said, well, I think it's worth it to listen to good Christian stuff all day long. And so I went and put the radio into the boat. And my brother Mark saw the radio, and he said, what's that for? And I said, well, we're going to listen to the Christian radio station. And he said to me, well, listen, I'm going to be honest with you. Nothing's going to be played on there but tapes and my tapes. Well, he's the captain, or was the captain. And so I said, well, we'll see about that. And we used to go out in the morning and I'd turn the radio on and we'd be listening to Back to the Bible and a little later on to John MacArthur. And, uh, and you know, uh, after I get down to the pilot house, only once I heard him put in a cassette. And I started to notice that I'd be listening to perhaps some of the people who were speaking and preaching. And, and later on, uh, as it got to progress a little bit on in the fall, my brother would tell me what was going on and what this preacher had said. And I found out that it was really unique because even though I couldn't hear it, he'd copy down or he'd listen to what was being said and then he'd be able to fill me in and uh, I'd be able to keep up. And I noticed that his life started to change. And one day, as we were going out in the lake, we had to go overnight and we were running out there. I uh, was looking and um, the thing that I like to do when I don't have to do anything is sleep. And so I was looking around for a place to sleep and I saw a bunk up there and I was crawling up there and I looked and uh, he was, wasn't sleeping and uh, 
dad was steering, and I thought, well, what are you doing, Mark? And he had this little book out in sin. And he was reading this book on, on how sin affects your lives. And when I saw that, it really, I felt like going through the floorboards. I mean, I'm a preacher here. Here's my brother reading stuff that's really good for his spiritual health. Well, I think that you get to see the idea that I'm trying to give to you, that my brother was, the Lord was changing him, and it was for the Lord's purpose. And the main focus of my brother's life before he left this earth was, summed up in one word, commitment. He left in these notes a statement. The first question is, what is commitment? Commitment is love. Then he has reason for commitment, unconditional love. And he's talking about our Heavenly Father's commitment to us and how he loved us so much that he was committed to you and to I. Now, commitment might not mean much to you except to the fact that, that when we start to realize what we are in God's sight, that, that we are as stinking, filthy rags in our sin, and then our Father loved us enough to send his Son, that's a sacrifice. And that's what Mark was really talking about. And, and what he wanted to bring out is that we need to be uh, love, uh, have unconditional love in return to our Lord. And then he goes on, number three is an example. When a girl and a guy get married. And then he went on with number four, a definition of a Christian. What is a Christian? We all know that you become a Christian when you ask the Lord to come into your heart. Okay, that's when you become one. Now, what is one? A Christian is what it says. Christ, li uh, Christ ones, little Christ, like Christ. And so if you are a Christian, you should be trying to be like Christ. A person is a Christian when that person starts to live and act like one in Matthew chapter 7, verse 20. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Otherwise, in other words, a, peop uh, a person will know you by your actions if you aren't or are a Christian. Conclusion. That brings me to commitment. Don't get me wrong. I'm not judging you because Matthew 7, 1 says, Judge not that ye be not judged, and do not judge lest you be judged. So then, you'll know them by their fruits. A summary. What is commitment? A. It is willing to do something for someone or thing, get these words, at any cost. Commitment is to put into custody. Commitment is to put your life in the custody of Jesus Christ. Commitment is to bind as by a promise or a pledge. Those were the last words my brother wrote. And I realize that in my life, I am often very uncommitted in my mind. You see, I'm one of those people who are running around and doing everything. Somebody once said to me, why aren't you ever at home, Phil? I'm too busy to be at home. Sometimes people come to visit us, and they've come to our place three times, and three times nobody's been home. I'm busy, but am I really committed? The last two statements, to put into custody, to put in custody of Jesus Christ as to bind, as by a promise or pledge. And I read that and I realized that's exactly what my brother did. And as he was going to meet the Lord, he said, okay, Lord, here I am. I am yours. Can you say that this morning? I mean, you might be here at church, but you might have come to listen to somebody speak. But since I'm the speaker, maybe not. You might have come to meet your friends. You might have come to be entertained. You might have come to learn a little bit. But the question really is right now is how committed are you? Are you willing to say, Lord, this is my life. If you want to take it right now, do it. But let it speak to people. That is commitment. Well, I think that's the first thing in making anybody's life count. 
is being committed as a Christian. Just so willing to be committed that you're willing to say, Lord, whenever you want me, I'm yours. And then we get into the area that John was in this morning. And I think that's being motivated by the right motives. And in this day and age, we have people who are very, very busy as myself, but they're not always being motivated for the right motives. I'd like you to notice that Jesus Christ's disciples were chosen not on the basis of what they were professionally. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, who would ever want a bunch of fishermen to follow them? If you're going to build an organization like a church, what do you get? If you're going to build an organization like Compassion, what do you get? You get a bunch of fishermen who, you know, sort of smell and, you know, that even though they're by the water, they don't believe in taking baths maybe? Or these guys were tax collectors, the scum of the earth. Nobody liked them. Or you go and take people who, you know, were sort of introverts and didn't believe in really caring. That's the sort of people that Jesus took. Go back and you read the way that each one came. Remember Nathaniel? The way that the Lord spoke to him. And the Lord said, An Israelite in whom no, there is no guile. And what did the Lord say? Or what did Nathaniel say about when he, where Jesus came from? He said, What good thing can come from Nazareth? Because it was a military town where they used to have soldiers all the time. And the soldiers used to gamble and, and uh, they had their own prostitutes and everything else. So it was a very, very corrupt town. One that we really wouldn't want to raise our kids in. If it was a, one of our towns today, it would be a town that would be full of drugs and things. And so he says, what kind of good thing can come out of Nazareth? And he was right from the straight. When you saw him and, and he didn't like the dress that you, that you were wearing or the way that your hair was, he'd probably say, well, what's the matter with your hair? And if you'd spent three or four hours fixing it up, that wouldn't be a very good compliment to you. Or he didn't like the way that you were wear, w working, Nathaniel would be straight, quite straightforward. You go back and you look at the other disciples, and each one of them were just a little bit different than what I would choose. You know, if I was going to build an organization and, and in our company as we're looking for people, we sort of look for people who are self-starters is the word that we like to use. We're people who are willing to go and to accomplish something in life. And yet the Lord really didn't grab those people and make them his disciples. In fact, the people that he took were called people. And their calling was the basis for their ministry. And I think that you could really parallel that to Ephesians chapter 5 and you find out from them that we are, as Christians are first of all called. And we need to remember that fact. Jesus I think perhaps maybe from my perspective should have taken some of those that came to him to volunteer. Do you remember those people? Remember the rich man when he came to the Lord and said, Hey, Lord, I will follow you anywhere. And uh, Jesus said, Well, have you done these things? And he said, Yeah, I have done all those things. And then Jesus said, There's only one thing that you haven't done. What's that? You need to give away all your riches, riches and then come after me. That really hit that person very low. I, get, I don't think you can go much lower than the pocketbook to some people. That's where it hit him. But it not only hit him in his pocketbook, but in his heart. And that man's mind and motives were struck on riches. I don't know if that guy got rich on his own. He might have been. He might have been an entrepreneur that really made a lot of money. But he was a driven person. A person who had a drive. Remember some of the Pharisees that came to the Lord? That's the reason why they were Pharisees is because they wanted recognition and people to realize who they were and what type of people that they could be. There were the public officials that came to the Lord and to, make, to, to uh, get some recognition. But all these people were people who were driven, busy, 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 doing things all the time, always running, always moving. And those aren't the type of people that the Lord wanted. I think perhaps it is because that all those people came to the Lord with the wrong motives. And when the Lord took his disciples, he didn't, they didn't come to him. Rather, he went to them. And it's very interesting from Scripture's point of view that three times the Lord went to the disciples, and, and Peter and James and John, and uh, I think I got them all, Andrew, 
the, th the four of them, he called them three separate times, three distinct times. And in that calling, he called Matthew, he called Nathaniel, he called all those people to be his disciples. They did not come to him. There weren't any volunteers. Because people who volunteer are often doing things for the wrong reason. We want to make a name for ourselves. We want to be strong. We want to be bold. We want to be recognized. You see, people's drives force them to be successful, uh, successful or at least accomplish what they want. Today, we are driven people. Dr. Joel Elks of the University of Louisville says our motto life itself and the way we live is emerging as the principal cause of death. In other words, because we're so busy running around and seeing what we can do and being driven with the, 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 the zest of life, we're so busy that that is killing us. Driven is describing the condition of pursuing our, our pursuing life. And I'd like you to notice, uh, I've been reading a book, and a lot of this comes from that book that has influenced my thinking in the last little while, and it's called uh, Ordering Your Private World by Dr. Gordon MacDonald. And in there, he describes driven people with eight problems, or there's eight dangers with them. First of all, uh, driven people are gratified with their own accomplishments. Let me stop for a second. How many of you have a diploma hanging on your wall? Or how many of you have something that, 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 that you mark success by? In our house, we don't have a trophy case. And in fact, we don't have any trophies. I guess I've never been too successful in school. But I've gone into a house not too long ago, I, and I can remember a trophy case in the middle of the living room. And in front of that trophy case, there was trophies after trophies after trophies, and there was the small ones at the, at the front, and the medium ones in the middle, and the big, big ones at the back. And the, the small ones were about that big. The mediums were that big, and the big ones were as big as you could see. This guy had been a champion skidoo racer and won many, 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 many uh, skidoo races. And it just awed me to see all these trophies, just a, a box like that, just all full of gleaming white trophies. And he'd measured his successes in the way that he got around the circuit and how he climbed up and did all that hard work displayed right there. And each one of us have little things within our minds that we measure our success by. How many people come to hear us speak? How many people listen to us when we talk? Like E.F. Hutton. How many people are interested in us? how many people we influence, but it's always these little wee things that we check off all the time. What are my accomplishments today? Driven people are gratified with their own accomplishments. Second all, driven people are occupied with symbols of success. You know, one of the things that we often use for success today is the cars that we drive or the houses that we live in or the furnitures that we have or the stereos that we listen to or the televisions that we watch. There's always something material that we plot that along and, and it, it tends to be that for those of us who are driven people, we always want just a little bit better, a little bit bigger car. You know, not, not a, a, a Chevette anymore. I mean, we're moving up now and now we want a Bromham a 98 Oldsmobile or something like that. As with my cousin who, who uh, used to make a lot of money when he was working for Gomel Central on the boats, he was buying a car the, the other day when I was with him and we were around looking at some of the cars in Thessalon and the guy wouldn't give him a big enough deal so we left there. But I was just looking at, at the symbols of success. And you know, when you buy a car that is really well off, you get all these little doodads. You have to pay for them, but they automatically put them in the car because they expect you to pay for them. And I realize that, that when a person buys a twenty or $30,000 car, he expects that to be in his car. There's a preoccupation there with the symbols of success. All of us are. All of us have those. Usually caught with an uncontrollable pursuit of expansion, to grow, get bigger, bigger, to influence more and more people, to get better known, to carry our message further. Driven people usually have a limited regard for integrity. 
if you don't really understand that, then get a hold of somebody who owns a business. And you sit beside him and watch the hard decisions that he has to make sometimes in order to be honest or just cross the line into dishonesty. I mean, it's not really being black and white and, and dishonest here. It's just sort of a little gray. And we all do that in our own lives. Sometimes we stretch a story or we talk to somebody and we make ourselves to be a little bit better than we are. Or all these things. All of us have this, ten, uh, this tendency to, to have a limited regard for integrity. Then often we possess a limited or undeveloped people skill. For driven people, that's quite common. We get caught up in our own little shells, our own little world, and we're so busy, we're only thinking about what we're going to do, and we don't think about our neighbors. And oh, how this hits home when I think of the neighbor across my street who perhaps might be dying any day. And as I went over there to talk with him last week, I realized that's the first time that I've talked to him in over a month. And we have this common interest. Believe it or not, it's a little dog. That little dog sits out in front of my house. I own him, incidentally. And he sits out in front of our house in the lawn and he pushes this tractor back and forth and this ball up and down the ditch. And these people had a dog just like him. And they're fascinated with him and they watch this dog out their window all the time. And I know I have something to go and talk this ma to this man about the Lord with. We have a common ground. And I can be over there talking with him and getting him to help me train my dog as he trained his dog. But I get too busy. And very often, my very best friends, I hardly know. One of my friends in Iron Bridge is a school teacher. And his parents live in, in Thessalon, his parents and her parents. And... I think they're the only people in Iron Bridge that are busier than I am. Sometimes when I go to visit them, they're even gone. And I, often we get talking, and the only times we see each other is when we, we make an arrangement to call each other on the telephone, or we have this night set apart, or sometimes we see each other even in church. Uh, he usually opens the meetings, and I do the speaking. So we're bound to see each other there sometimes. But I notice that we're so busy that we don't develop any interpersonal relationships in our community with anybody. And I don't know if you're really well aware about that, uh, uh, with this idea, but the most effective communication of the gospel today is not the words that are coming out of your mouth, but it's the life that you're living. You see, that's why we need to be committed. That's why we need to be motivated for the right me reasons. It's because people are looking at your life and they're wondering, why is this dipstick running all over? What is he doing? Is he making more money? Has he found a way? And when you say no, they back off and they don't have any attention. You don't have their attention anymore. We need to develop people skills so that we can reach people for our Lord. In school, at work, in our, besides, beside us at our homes and our neighbors. Lastly, or I should say third lastly, uh, there's a tendency for people, uh, people to, driven people to be highly competitive. Have you ever noticed this in churches? Oh, this stands out so much. I don't know if you've ever been to a big city, but I've noticed sometimes that in a big city they have this poor habit of having a whole bunch of churches on one street. When I was growing up in Iron, uh, Blind River, we had four or five churches on one street. And I noticed that they use little gimmicks to get people. Some churches have this flashy neon sign outside. Church services today at 11. Doctor such and such speaking. And then the next guys, they don't have that, but they have this busing program, and they're bringing in people. And it's a, it's a, a seesaw to see who's going to bring in the biggest crowd, and who's going to get the most people, and whose offering's going to be the biggest. Boy, oh boy. Church people tend to be really highly, highly, highly competitive. And I bet you you're that way in your own life. I know that I sure am in my professional life. And it really dawned on me one day as, as I, I was thinking that, that I hate to see people get ahead of me. That's where highly competitiveness really comes in. And so I start plotting how can I do as well as they. I hate to see somebody get ahead of me in class when I was in school. So I think, now, what can I do? I can study, 
Or maybe I can think of a shorter route to do it. That never worked. I should have studied. They possess a volcanic sense of anger. You ever see anybody mad? You know anybody who ever gets mad? Probably not. I get mad a lot. When things get frustrating for me, I get really frustrated, I get mad, and I get upset. My wife knows that it's never a really big blow up. It's just that I'm upset all day long because these little things go wrong. And you know where you can really see this in? Is your children. I was sitting there one day, about uh, two weeks ago, watching Timothy. And he's playing with a pair of Tycho's, which is like Legos, only they don't fit as well. And he's trying to get his, his tycles t t to line up so he could have a tower. And he'd get them together and they would stick almost, and then it would sort of come apart. And he wouldn't have it quite stuck together, you know. There would just be a millimeter of distance in there where the two would finally cement together and he would never quite get it. And so it would fall apart and he'd stick it together again and would fall apart again. And I seen him take those two little things and he'd shake his fist and he had one in each fist and goes, Oh! And I realized that he was mimicking me and what I do. Boy, that did something to me. Maybe I should carry out my conduct before my children just a bit different. And it's hard for you to teach your children when they're saying, I can't get my shoes on and I can't get it done, to say, well, son, let's attack this problem when you don't do it yourself. You know, let's, let's sit down and let's do it one step at a time and see how we can do it. You know, first of all, you have to untie the laces. You ever notice when kids get out of shoes, they forget to undo the laces? That's the parent's job, in case you didn't know it. And then we untie the laces. They can do that by themselves, by the way. Any kid that's, that, that has a hand and a fist can do that. They just grab them. They do it, you know, even when they're just a couple months old. You put a little bowl around your neck, they jerk it out. So I'm sure kids can undo laces. And then you get them to undo the laces, and then they, they sometimes walk around the house with my shoes on or their shoes on on the wrong feet, you know, just plain. But when it comes time to leave, they can't get them shoes on their feet. And that's just a bunch of baloney. So I say, now, things that you have to remember is you untie your laces, sit down, and play with your shoes until you get them on. Okay? And then you can do the first part of the knot, and then you call me, and I'll do the second part. And you know what? Daddy, I can't get my shoes on. Have you done that? Have you sat down and done what I've told you to do? Tack the problem. No, no, no. He says, I, I, I can't do it. I've tried it. And then you know what? I'll come out tomorrow and they'll be playing and that kid will be wearing his shoes exactly what, the way that I wanted to. But when I want him to go it and do it now, he can't do it. And the stupid thing is, he does exactly like I do. You know, when things aren't going our own way, there's a volcanic sense of anger there and frustration. Last thing about driven people is they're abnormally busy. Do you know what? The Bible tells us that Saul was that type of person. And uh, this morning, I'm afraid because of our time, I'd like you just to take down the reference and check me out. But in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, it tells us that Saul was a very... Uh, it tells us who his mother, and, or his father and his grandfather were. It gives us his lineage there, which is a help. But then it tells us his wealth. It tells us, uh, us his attractiveness. And then it tells us his well -developed, about his well-developed body. Strange thing to, to talk about, eh? I mean, we thought we were only preoccupied with that in, in, in our century now, where you see all these guys lifting out and all the television commercials, the beer commercials now. Isn't that just a... It makes me laugh to realize that if you don't do that and drink beer, you, you get a tummy out here, you know. And so now they, they, they've got the idea that if you drink beer, you're going to be fat. And so now in the beer commercials, what do they have you doing? Lifting out. Everybody's lifting out, okay? And so they're all working, you know, so they won't have their little, whatever they want to call it, pot belly from drinking beer. And so they, everybody's now caught up in this idea of fitness and everything. And you can see it even in other commercials, like clothes commercials, you know, because they, you have to have fitness clothes. You have to have fitness shoes and fitness everything else. And so everybody's caught up with this idea of fitness. And we thought that was only a 20th century thing. But actually, it was very important to have a well-developed body if you were going to be a warrior. I mean, it was sort of hard to be a warrior if you couldn't lift your own shield because you were going to get shot the first time out there. And it, it was sort of hard to be a, a warrior if you couldn't pull a bull back because uh, 
if the, if the archers were out there, you'd probably get killed before you got close to the line. And it was sort of hard to be a, a real good warrior if you couldn't lift the sh your uh, spear and go after somebody because somebody else probably could lift their spear and you'd end up dying real fast. So he had three things that would really help him be really good at what he wanted to do. He had wealth. I should say four things, actually. He had a good family background. He had wealth. He had attractiveness. And then he had a well-developed body. Three things. Now, you know what? Each one of us has things that the Lord has given to us that can help us in our ministry. Now, when I say ministry, people always think about the pulpit. But I'm not talking about that ministry. The Lord called you. What did He call you to? To live the Christian life, but to serve Him also. And so all of us have a ministry in some area, whether it is teaching Sunday school, speaking from a pulpit, or witnessing to our neighbors, or helping other Christians. Somewhere, there's a ministry. And you're responsible for that because you were called to it. Just as the disciples were called to what they had. You know, in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 8 to 14, we find out that, that they were having a, a sacrifice there, and they're getting ready to do battle. And as they were waiting, Saul was sitting there waiting for Samuel to come, and he was walking back and forth. He'd been walking back and forth for two weeks, and all of a sudden, he lost his patience, and he said, now is the time we're going to do the sacrifice. And so he goes and he does that sacrifice right there. And who should come down the road but Samuel right after that? Why did Samuel come down the road? Because God was waiting for that moment. You know, if Saul would have done that sacrifice two, a week before that, Samuel would have been there a week before that. If, Samuel, if he would have waited another two weeks, it would have taken Samuel two more weeks to be there. Because that sacrifice that Saul did showed us one thing, that he was a driven person and that his motives were to get out and fight rather than look to the Lord for, and for his blessing. You see, he was in a position that God had placed him in, even as you and I are as ministers, wherever we minister. But he'd taken that, and he'd gone with it, and he was doing something with it now. But his motives were wrong. Right position, wrong motives. You see, the reason why I want to talk about being a driven person this morning and why we're going to finish this up is because our churches are full of driven people. This church this morning, the chapel is just full of driven people. And though you might be a lazy slob, we have a fellow who works for us who comes with his hair uncombed and unkept. That's me. And we have another fo fellow who comes who never has, you know, at least I try and keep my shirt tucked in, but he doesn't come with his shirt tucked in. And as I was talking to uh, one of the other ladies who works for us last night or yesterday while we were working, she says, I think he's a lazy slob. And I was just looking to see if everything was all right with me before I, you know, I could throw a stone or anything. And I realized that people look at us and, and we might feel like we're lazy slobs, that we don't do anything. But you know what? We're still driven people. We're driven by any, a, a sense of not to do anything. And so we're going to gratify ourselves by listening to what we want to do. If it's just lazing around or being unkept or undressed, we're still driven. We're still motivated and done by something. Well, the cure for us as driving people is exactly what Christ did in Matthew, exactly what Christ did in Mark, exactly what Christ did in Luke and John. I want you to stop and think now. When the Lord was talking with the disciples and they were doing something, you'd almost always hear the Lord say, Now why do you want to do that? Or why are you doing that? You remember when the mothers of Salem came and they brought their children to Jesus? And the disciples were shooing them away? Jesus said, Don't do that. Why are you doing it? Hey, these are for me. These are, are my children. The disciples one time were fighting, Who is going to be the greatest? And the Lord said, why are you doing that? Don't do that. He said, the greatest one is going to be the servant. Remember at the feeding of the 5,000, the Lord said to the disciples, how should we attack this problem? And one of them was quick on his feet. He probably had his little calculator out, and he was moving his beads back and forth. And he was saying, you know, we don't have enough money. We could never buy enough bread for all these people. The Lord was checking their motives. 
And if you're going to be a real good, strong Christian right now, not only do you have to be committed, but you have to have pure motives. And the pure motives need to be motives that are always being checked. Just as the Lord did to the disciples. I remember so clearly in, in John chapter 21 as the Lord was talking to Peter. Peter had failed the Lord dismally. And I, I can't feel uh, help but feel that he felt just really embarrassed about this. And so the Lord was saying, Peter, do you want to go and feed my sheep? Do you want to feed my lambs? And, and Peter was saying, and he was saying, do you love me? And Peter just really didn't want to say anything. He says, yes, Lord, you know that I, I love you as a friend. I don't, I'm not a gawpy love you. I don't love you with unconditional love. And as they're going through this, the Lord was really questioning Peter. And then he gave them that final command. You feed my sheep. You see, Christians today have been mo operating, operating and being motivated by their own motives. And what we need to get back to is the sense of being called. When the Lord took the disciples and he worked with them for three, maybe three and a half years, some of them he knew longer than that, by the way. He worked with these people. He taught them a lesson. Look at what you're doing and why are you doing it. Get to know yourself. And then you can say, Lord, I'm doing this so I can be important. And often when I get called to speak on an and I must say there was a lot of nervousness as I was coming here this morning. But often and almost every time I, I'm called to speak on, I get really nervous. One day I, I thought, you know, this is really great. Because before I go up into the pulpit, I say, now, Lord, I want people to learn your word. And if I can just be your vessel, then that's what I want. I don't care if they pat me on the back and say, well, Philip, that was really good service. And sometimes I'm a little disappointed when I stand at the door and people don't pat me on the back and say, Phil, that was a really good service. But the overall sense of my uh, desire of my heart is to teach God's Word so that we can understand it. To take God's concepts, which are the hard, the lofty, the, the full things of God, and put it down into shoe leather. And so this morning as I get ready to close, I want to leave you with this one, two things that if you want to make your life effective, if you want to stand before the Lord and not have all the things that you have done burn up, make sure that you're committed, first of all, to our Savior. To quote from my brother, Commit to, commitment is to put your life in custody of Jesus Christ. Have you really done that? I mean, you might have said, Lord, I will serve you. Just don't call me to Africa. Lord, I will serve you. Just don't get me to witness to my friends at high school. Lord, I will serve you, but I won't talk to the people at work. Lord, I will serve you, but don't ask me to do anything at church or at prayer meeting or anything. That's not service. That's not even commitment. That's not even custody. When you have custody, you have something. And custody is, here, Lord, this is my life. It's yours. No hands. You know what? That is a very fearful thing to do. I'll be honest with you. He might take you home. He might not. That's the worst thing. You might have to live here a while. But there will be a reward. When I think back of my brother, and at his funeral, as I, after we had read and we talked, my uncle shared... And then the pastor of the church that he goes to, 40 people got up and went to the front of that church. And whenever there's a funeral and a young man has lost his life, we have this tendency to, you know, do things on impulse. Oh, I feel so sorry. I'll, I'll go to the front. And as I was talking to, to a few of those people who went to the front, I said, uh, why did you go up there? And they said, because I needed to. And I got the sense that they weren't doing it because they were some emotional thing pulling them to the front. It was the fact that they had really seen 